COP 209, Automate Everything, Options and Best Practices. Uh, my name is Aaron Lima. I'm a Principal Solutions Architect, as you heard during the uh, microphone check from New Jersey. Um, I'm here presenting with Emily Arnatovic, who's a Principal Solutions Architect out of Melbourne, Australia. And then a little bit later, we're going to hear from Ashish Wadwa, who's the Director of Cloud Engineering at Sun Life. Um, so just get a real quick uh, in terms of agenda. We're going to look at a example from the past and see what we can learn from that example. And from that example, we're going to learn why automation matters. Then we're going to look at a day in the life of a cloud uh, admin. And then we're going to revisit that day of the life of that cloud admin when they've implemented some of the AWS services to automate tasks within their organization. And then we're going to take a listen to Sun Life about their journey uh, on the cloud and how they've built some automation into their processes. And then finally, we'll have a summary of next steps. So I think we all can agree that the invention of the car has changed the world. Uh, however, with most consumer products, when it first came out, it was a luxury item that only a few could afford. Now, picture here is a 1917 Ford Model T, which was $850 US at that time. Now, Henry Ford had a goal of making the car affordable to every family. And on a visit to a Chicago meat parking plant, he noticed how meat uh, flowed from station to station very uh, conveniently on a conveyor belt and how labor was used to an efficient uh, degree to create uh, meat for affordable for families. And so he started to think maybe this could be applied to manufacturing cars. So Ford thought through the workflow of producing a car and he was able to implement what we see here, which is the automotive assembly line. And by 1924, the price of the Ford Model T dropped to $260 and it made it attainable to most American families, and it achieved Ford's business goals. But the key part was it also gave Ford a competitive advantage as the automotive industry headed into the Great Depression. In 1919, there were some 2,000 American motor companies, and by 1940, there were only three companies that accounted for 90% of all US car sales, which were Chrysler, GM, and of course Ford. Now, each of those companies had adopted the assembly line and automation, which allowed them to thrive during the headwinds of their time. Well, what was the impact of the workers? Well, Ford's employee staff went from 14,000 employees to 52,000, so there was a lot more employment to go around, and their wages doubled per day. So they made more per day for less hours of work. So it impacted the employees as well, and it gave them different uh, career opportunities moving forward. So what's the point? Well, the past can inform the future, and it can help us to set a vision for each one of our organizations. Automation changed an industry and allowed those three car manufacturers who embraced it to weather one of the worst financial crises in the Great Depression. And it changed the work life of the employees. It gave them different opportunities from moving forward in their careers. So let's fast forward to today, why we're all here, and how does this apply to our industry of information technology and each of us personally? Now, despite being in an industry that's leading the way with automation, with AI and ML, there's still a lot of manual processes in many of our, our organizations. So we have to ask ourselves, 100 years after uh, Ford moved forward with automation to improve uh, his business, uh, how are we doing with automation to truly thrive in ours? And of course, we're gonna take a look at some data. Now, according to one report, 94% of U.S. knowledge workers surveyed uh, said that they spend some portion of their day performing a repetitive, time-consuming task. And according to a Deloitte report, 80% of developers uh, focus on operations and maintenance rather than innovating on behalf of their organization. And what spurred this uh, session was I was speaking to a customer a couple of months ago, and we talked about how to get visibility in their AWS estate. And when we talked about the services to turn on, the immediate reaction that I got wow, I have to go to each one of these accounts manually and turn it on. And then I asked them, well, what is your automation for bootstrapping accounts? Or how are you automating things inside of uh, your organization? And they didn't have a plan or a strategy. And right now, between the pandemic, the great resignation, and indicators that we're heading into a, uh, an economic recession, there's no better time to start thinking about automation and consider about how that can impact your organization, but also, how it can impact your career. And this leads to the question, why should we automate at all? 
And again, Amazon is a data-driven company, so let's take a look at some statistics from a 2021 State of DevOps report. Now, in these statistics, they highlight the benefits of being highly automated. And in this report, correspondents were classified into four different categories, but the one that we're gonna focus on is those that were highest, or what were called elite. Um, and the elite organizations were organizations that had a high degree of automation in their development life cycle and in their operations. Now, elite performers have a three times lower change failure rate. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that these organizations can make changes to their environment um, without disruption to their organization. And really what that translates to is that the people who work in that organization are not working nights and weekends uh, to roll back changes or to implement changes. Now these organizations can go from code to production in less than an hour, and that means that the security checks, uh, quality assurance, they're all done in an automated fashion. And it also means that they can respond to market changes very quickly. Um, and uh, it also, because they're fully automated and they have all these checks, uh, they're not only more agile, but they're also more secure. And then finally, when we look at the last one, less than one hour to recover, again, if there's an operational security event in these elite performers, they can recover their services within an hour. And for me, if I work in that organization, what that means is I'm not always working nights and weekends to ensure that the uh, business is working and I can spend more time with my family. And from that report, one of the key things is that these elite performers uh, create a culture that revolve around three things. Everything is codified. So because everything is as code inside of their organizations, they have a high degree of visibility in what's going on. And from that high degree of visibility, they can respond to incidents in an automated fashion. They can also do deployments in an automated fashion. And so hence why they can take code from code to production in an hour, and that they're able to uh, roll back changes. And what we're really talking about, and the reason why I'm wearing a Hawaiian shirt, is because at the end of the day, uh, it's about impacting not just your organization and giving yourself a better path forward career-wise, but it's also making sure that you have that good work-life balance. And what you see here on the left-hand side are some of the things myself and Emily enjoy when presenting this, uh, put, repeating together this presentation. We realize we both like to bake, and we both like to uh, spend time on the beach. And so that's really what automation and all this means for us. I'm gonna turn it over to Emily to talk about kind of the state of automation as we look forward, or how it was, I should say. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. So, the good news is that adopting automation now is actually easier than it has been in the past. And in fact, automation into the software and infrastructure process this has generally increased across the board in all industries, and that is thanks to cloud. So because of a cloud APIs and services, automation at scale is actually not only available to those elite performers that uh, Aaron talked about. All organizations, regardless of your size or your team's skill set, can start to incorporate automation into your processes. So when we prepared this session, Aaron and I spent a lot of time talking about our careers, and we were thinking back to 10 years ago. And we reflected on what it was like working in IT back then. And for most organizations, making a change in production was a really big deal. So we've got you know, a lot of stories from, from that time. We are talking about you know, months of planning, uh, weeks maybe if you were lucky and you actually had the infrastructure that you needed. But even provisioning a VM, you know, that would take 90 days because the automation was just harder to achieve with the technology at the time. So back then, maybe some of you in the room remember this, changes would often involve detailed plans in project planning tools or spreadsheets. A lot of those production changes, you had multiple different teams. You had guides, installation guides, configuration guides that you'd be using for updating uh, operating system, middleware, installing libraries, lots of, lots of clicking through and documenting what you're trying to do. Fair enough, we had some scripts. Oftentimes, lots of homegrown scripts and lots, lots of these were kind of fragile. And the thing that also stood out to me is it was actually near impossible to have some good visibility of what was happening in your environment at that time to know, hey, at each layer of that software and infrastructure stack, what is that current state? So this really left the visibility to telephone at that time, right? So it was before Zoom. I'm talking about long conference calls, bridges with everyone involved in the change. 
Maybe there's some people in the room that have experienced this. Um, you know, if it was today, you'd probably replace that with a Slack channel. And when I was working on these changes, I wasn't working on some amazingly complicated system. It was a typical three-tier application that had a few integration points to some other systems. Lots of customer transactions, lots of data. It was an important system, but it wasn't something super crazy. But we had a really low level of visibility on this change. We had limited telemetry and metrics to let us know what was happening in real time. And we had to rely on people manually and carefully documenting the changes they made. We had some scripts, like I mentioned, and we could use some logs to try and figure out, OK, has this thing installed? Is it updated? But overall, that whole orchestration process was really manual. And then we had to redo that every time we had a new kind of change. And so this was, this was pretty typical of changes in uh, software infrastructure stack before the cloud. So as I mentioned, processes like this with lots of manual steps, if you've been asked to work on an IT change in production, like that was a nail-binding moment. There was all this manual effort in planning the change, documenting it, executing it, and then all the comms to all the stakeholders who are involved. And this is a lot of work. So giving up your nights and your weekends to do changes was very typical. Generally, it was Saturday night into Sunday morning. Um, lots of hours spent planning and orchestrating this change. And that meant it was harder to recover when things would go, would go wrong. Say goodbye to your Sunday. So today, if you're using the cloud, this means that you, know, you don't actually um, have to be involved in all of these manual processes. Software infrastructure changes are a lot easier to plan for, to execute, and to repeat if you need. So for me, this is why I'm at AWS, when I saw how things could be done differently, I was like, yes, sign me up. I want some more of that infrastructure as code. I want managed services to help me manage provisioning, scaling, and more. And so most customers, when moving to the cloud, you know, they are taking advantage of infrastructure as code. They are using uh, infra as code to provision scalable cloud resources. But it's not just about infrastructure as code. There's so much more that you can do to make your life at work easier. So think about it. What else can you do? to allow more focus on creating business outcomes and value, and less time on maintaining or recovering systems. So today, Aaron and I actually still experience uh, customer situations like this with customers who are using cloud but still have a lot of these traditional IT processes that have been brought over. So those organizations are gaining some of the cloud benefits like flexibility and elasticity, but these operations tasks, many times they're still manual. And we were discussing, we're like, why is that a case? Is it true that organizations just don't want to be elite performers? Because it's actually really accessible for you all. I don't know. All we could think of is, you know, maybe some other people aren't as excited about weekends and holidays as Aaron and I are. We're always looking to try to optimize and automate. But even if that's not you, as we heard earlier, with that growing need for IT skills, it's not the time to settle for suboptimal levels of automation. Just think about it. For every hour that you spend converting some manual effort into automation, that's an hour that you can spend on creating or improving something else. Aaron mentioned that state of DevOps report. So we talked about the metrics that elite performers achieve. Let's focus on two. So we've got that change failure rate and that time to restore service. When you're combining cloud services and DevOps processes, this is great. You can make a lot of changes more rapidly. So it means you can deliver things faster. But every time you make a change, there's that chance that sometimes things go wrong, right? So it's actually really important to be able to recover quickly from that failed change. That's critical. Now, we heard before, everything is code. If you've got all your steps documented in code, if you can find went wrong, what went wrong easily with telemetry, this allows you to quickly recover. So with all of this, making that change is a lot less stressful a lot less nail-biting, and a lot less likely to ruin your Saturday night. Aaron, you were telling me um, about a great recovery example here. Can you share that? Yeah, so I've been here at AWS for seven years. My first year, I was a TAM, and I covered a customer who had a fully automated process. They had the ability to tear down and, and build up their environments. And there was an S3 outage uh, that occurred, and I called them up, and I'm saying, hey, there's, and they told me, hey, we already know, we've already moved to another region. Um, because everything was fully automated in their case. And I was uh, extremely taken back. 
And I recently shared this with another customer recently, and the customer said, oh, they must have been all serverless. They weren't. They were using servers, they were using Redshift, they were replicating the data to the other region, but because they had that ability to spin up and spin down with automation, it was easy for them to also recover. Awesome. So if you're listening and you think, oh, we're a small team, I don't think we really need it, you might think, hey, we only run a few workloads. Maybe we can manage to get by with you know, less automation for a while. But you, know, you actually don't need a large team. You don't need to be running 100 workloads on cloud to get all the benefits from using more automation. So our goal, all three of us actually today, is to help you realize that you know, whether you've got two engineers or 2,000, we want to show you that looking for opportunities to automate, this is going to make software delivery more reliable, more visible, really important when you're communicating to all your stakeholders, and frankly, easier, right? So this is going to be vital for all organizations to be able to thrive and to be successful into the future. So let's illustrate this a little bit with our fictional customer. Her name is Mary Major. We're just going to go through a little bit of a week in the life of Mary. So she leads a cloud platform team. Maybe some of you in the audience are also leading a cloud platform team. And her job is to provision and manage uh, AWS accounts and set and govern cloud standards for her organization. They've got AWS for their website, CRM systems. They're running some analytics and some ML workloads and some other things. They've got infrastructure as code, so they do have some automation. But it's Monday, right? And Mary's come from a meeting, and the business says, hey, we've got this new initiative. And in that meeting, they all agreed, yes, this work, these workloads need to be isolated. So that means two new accounts, at least, right? Prod and non-prod. Mary's team manage a number of AWS accounts, and every time they get a request for a new account, that means pulling together their account configuration checklist, confirming the controls, confirming the permissions that they need to apply, they need to configure logging, monitoring, integration to third-party tools, and also apply some policies on the usage of AWS services. It's a big checklist they're running through. Now, Tuesday, her team are also trying to maintain visibility of what's happening in all of their environments. Being asked to add these two new accounts and go through all these checklists, this, this takes a bit of a time. So unfortunately, whilst working through that manual account creation checklist, the engineer got called away. Someone said, hey, actually, we're just interested in the compliance uh, report of all the existing accounts. So he went away and spent time running that manual report across all of their accounts. Came back, and he'd already handed over the accounts, those new accounts. And then he realized later in the evening, wait a minute. I forgot to include those new accounts. So the engineer ran through those compliance checklists again and realized that they had actually uh, missed some of the controls. And this would al potentially allow some malicious actors uh, to access their environment. Missed some controls for detecting public S3 buckets, missed some controls for ports, uh, missed some other controls on security groups. So in this case, the engineer stayed after hours, enabled those security controls, and updated the team. But this, this was like a whole day just spent doing this. So Wednesday, Mary's team has to hassle one of their workload teams, CRM team. They use a commercial off-the-shelf product, a COTS product. This runs on a number of EC2 instances. Now, every time uh, there's an operating system update, as part of the shared responsibility model, her team has to make sure that all of the different workloads update their EC2 instances. Typically, she'll send out some email reminder to that team and hassle them, hey, patch time, update. And then regularly, they'll run some periodic reports to see what's the patch compliance. Now, an OS update has been ready for a while. CRM team is behind that patch schedule again. The engineer had been blocking out Wednesday to do patching, but the business said, hey, can you help with some functional uh, changes instead to the environment? And they didn't get around to patching. So if the engineer doesn't want that CRM system to be behind yet again on patch compliance, maybe they're going to have to stay back that evening. Aaron, this was a sore point for you, patch compliance. Yeah, patch compliance was a sore point for me because early in my career I had one job where that's all I did was just to make sure that everything was patched and report on patching. And it wasn't an extremely exciting job until I you know, recommended to my employer, can we, can we automate this? Can I just automate this so I don't have to do this all the time? Um, and then that was a fun process uh, and a, you know, a, a boost in my career in terms of next steps. But yeah, man, you weren't doing that same thing day in, day out, manually patching. Correct. <laughs> So let's get to Thursday, right? 
there's another COTS workload that needs attention. So the team has raised a ticket to Mary's team and they need an engineer to help update the software that's, that's running for that COTS product. So these requests come in quite frequently. Vendor has a software update and they need uh, a way to remote log on to that environment to apply some configuration changes or maybe run a script. So Mary's team are maintaining bastion hosts on EC2 for all of the workloads that need that remote logon. That means that all of those operating system patches also need to be applied to those bastion hosts. So this is just more infrastructure they're maintaining. Now she's got these requests for these new accounts, getting a lot of new things in and just thinking, hang on, how many tickets do I have that just relate to patching, uh, remote logon, and so on? She's starting to feel a little bit tired about, by this tedious work. Gets to Friday, her team are like, it's almost the weekend, we're almost done. Hey, new requests come in. A lot of teams want to use cloud. And this time, there's a team that actually wants to uh, start running some workloads for one of the international subsidiaries in another region. So that means that Mary is going to have to enable a new region and new accounts and extend governance there. During that meeting, this same lead also says, remember we're all so close to closing an acquisition on another smaller company, and they actually already use AWS, so we need to bring all of their workloads under our governance as well. By this stage, Mary is realizing that some more automation is gonna give her some greater visibility and control. She knows her team can get the work done, they've got the right skills, but with all of those current manual processes, she's really not that confident to say, yeah, yeah, we can do that, no problem. Instead, she says, I'm gonna need some time to estimate this. This is effectively making the business wait this is just not a good position to be in. So a team had a long week, and what have they been doing, right? Just keeping their heads above water with business as usual activities. Um, Mary and her team, they want to help. They want to be involved in creating awesome outcomes for the business, but all they're doing is just operational tasks manually, right? So they could decide to work the weekend with work to try and get ahead, but she can see, hey, this is just something that's going to keep happening. So let's take a look at a framework that Mary and her team can use to help add some more automation and hopefully make their week at work and their weekend a whole lot more enjoyable and rewarding. Aaron, can you share? Yeah. So if you've attended another COP session this week, you might have seen this slide. Uh, this slide represents uh, the cloud ops journey or the cloud ops operations model. And so it requires three basically steps or pillars. The first is setup. So this is where you're setting your cloud foundation down um, where you have all the governance and compliance built in from the start. And then once you have all those in, uh, you have the confidence that you can migrate workloads in a secure and compliant manner into AWS. And then finally, the third is once it's existing inside of uh, the cloud, then you're continuing to operate that through application monitoring, enhancements, performance, and then detecting and remediating compliance. I mean, doing that in an automated fashion. And why this cloud ops model? Well, this is based upon, again, another data-driven uh, thing from AWS, an independent research of 1,500 AWS customers, um, where there's a return of investment of 241% over three years, a staff productivity increase of 62%, um, and then um, the more all-important carbon savings of 88% uh, coming into the cloud. And if you took a look at a bunch of the keynotes, you know that that's something that we're continuing to work on here at AWS. So again, to bring us back to what we're talking about uh, in our session, it comes down to having a culture, building a culture from the top down around three things, right? Everything should be codified, having that visibility into the security and performance of your environment and your workloads, and then automating and responding, not only on a provisioning standpoint, but also responding to the incidents that are happening inside of uh, your organization. So let's talk about this in practice, and let's take a look through Mary's week again but this time, she's implemented some AWS services and some of the things that we would recommend for AWS customers to do. And so we start with Monday. Now imagine, as we heard, Mary had some infrastructure as cloud built out. But now Mary's team decided to take that infrastructure as cloud and start implementing it in Control Tower. And they've set up the account factory in Control Tower as well, along with some customizations. So now they can spin up an account, and when they spin up that account, a security hub is enabled, config is enabled, cloud trail is enabled, all out the gate automation um, from uh, Control Tower. They also have IAM roles that they create for necessary automation processes inside of their account, and their VPCs, security groups, all of that is created on the fly. So now because they have that automation in place, when the business comes to Mary, instead of opening up a request, 
she has enabled self-service. So she allows the business to create those accounts without having to interact with Mary's team. And she knows that the full set of governance controls and guardrails are gonna land in that account. Now let's take a look what this might look like in practice with a real quick demo. Can you walk us through this demo, Emily? Sure, so here I'm in Control Tower and you can see a few of the actions, lots of different things. A few updates this week for Control Tower, so I highly recommend you check it out. Uh, so you can see here, you can apply your uh, controls as well. And uh, in, your, in your landing zone, you can easily specify the regions that you're operating in. So you can hear, see here the ones that are governed and non-governed. So Mary could make use of that. You can easily see your entire organization and all of your accounts. And you can easily create, using Account Factory, as Aaron mentioned, a brand new account. So there's examples that we ha heard from Mary. This is an easy way to solve all of that. And now also with Control Tower having APIs, you can also programmatically uh, do that uh, via outside the console as well. Now we come on to Tuesday. So now Control Tower has been implemented. And as we had mentioned previously, it's enabling AWS Config and AWS CloudTrail in every single account inside of the organization. Now, this built-in is, again, as we mentioned, is automation out of the box, but as part of that account vending mechanism, but now also in Control Tower, you can do this um, uh, out of the box. She's enabling Security Hub and Guard Duty. Now, Guard Duty helps with this uh, automated advanced threat detection and response on AWS, so if things happen and they become a security finding inside of an account, you can have an automatic remediation to either shut down a security, uh, EC2 instance or change a security group. Now, when you're managing multiple AWS accounts, having this in a central account um, is important, and that's what Mary has done. So in this central account, she's given access to her security team um, so that they can see what's happening, and they don't have to say, hey, Mary, what's, what's going on in the account? Give me a report. They have access to that information. So by automatically enabling these services, every single account in the multi-account environment, um, through this mechanism in Control Tower, they have the high visibility into their AWS estate. So on Tuesday, Mary just goes and checks to make sure that that account that was created on Monday by the business has all the security control, security posture, and now she can report and show the business that it is a compliant account according to the guardrails that have been created. Now in building these detective controls, she knows that these accounts are secure. Uh, we'll look at this in practice. Go ahead, sorry, I jumped ahead. <laughs> That's all right. So uh, in, in Control Tower, Mary is able to provide access to the security team, they can log into that audit account, and here they're going to go to Security Hub. Now, it wouldn't be fun if I showed you Security Hub with everything looking green. So as part of this demo, we played around and we deployed a whole bunch of uh, resources that were non-compliant to the standards to see that if this were the case, Mary would easily be able to see, hey, what are these uh, best practices that have been applied, and can I see exactly for all of the different accounts in my environment, uh, what is their compliance like to standards? Which of those resources that are most out of standard? Um, and you can see here just some examples of the kind of security controls that you can easily apply. Have that in one place, again, for all of the accounts, and not have someone in your team doing manual checks to try and figure out you know, what's compliant in what environment. You can easily filter, and you can also build automations and integration to uh, to actually improve and uh, remediate some of these findings as well. And the point that I forgot to mention in the other uh, slide is that Mary now knows that there's no open S3 public buckets or any kind of open uh, security groups. So now let's advance on to Wednesday. So on Wednesday we were talking about patch management, my favorite topic. Um, so Mary's team are especially grateful that they've looked at AWS Systems Manager and that they've adopted it. And Systems Manager is the superstar for operations automation and management of EC2 instances inside of AWS. Um, and there's other things that it has also where it can automate things inside of an AWS account. But before using Systems Manager, they had an infrastructure just to manage and maintain patch management. So now they've eliminated that infrastructure of having to manage that infrastructure at scale inside of AWS. And so it's much easier for them and they've eliminated cost. And so because they were able to uh, Eliminate all that, but the way that they did that is they created a state manager association in every single account as part of their bootstrapping process that scans accounts on a weekly basis to see how it meets to their patch baseline. And then Mary has created a maintenance window that 
goes off every Saturday that remediates any of the non-compliant EC2 instances inside of her estate. Now, because Security Hub is also on, those non-compliant instances or compliant instances in patch management automatically get reported into Security Hub as findings, and so then the security team who's looking at that has a good understanding of what's compliant, what's not compliant, and they can only um, bother Mary if there's any non-compliant resources. But what Mary has done is that she's also automated the sending out of that report to management to show that she's compliant. So there's a way in Patch Manager where you can export a report, and then you can shoot that report so that you can show people, here's a set of EC2 instances across my estate that are compliant to my patch baseline. And let's take a look at what this might look like in practice. Uh, so here, we're taking a look at Systems Manager, which is the operational cockpit uh, inside of AWS for managing your EC2 instances. And I should click one more time to make sure that the video plays. <clears throat> and what we see is that Mary has gone into quick setup. Now in quick setup, there's the ability to create a configuration across your AWS organization. So what we see here, they've created a quick setup across the organization that has set up the foundational uh, components for Systems Manager to operate inside of these accounts. And Mary can take a look at what type of uh, in accounts have been configured, if they have any failed configuration or not. And then she goes back to the console, and now we're gonna take a look at Explorer. Now in this environment, what we have is that the Explorer is aggregating the data across all of the organization. So we've created uh, what's called a data sync. Um, that's an organizational data sync that's gonna go into each one of these accounts and collect what's, how many EC2 instances we have, what software has been installed in those EC2 instances. So we can see that we have 34 instances. Now when we click in these 34 instances, the key here is that these instances are not in just one region. So we see that they're in multiple regions that are being managed and governed by Mary's team, and they're also in different AWS accounts, right? So this is across the estate, getting a holistic view of what's going on. Now Mary's gonna go back, and we're gonna take a look at how we're doing against patch compliance. So she's gonna go back to the Explorer dashboard, she's gonna go down and take a look at the um, patch non-compliant instances for patching, and we notice that there's three instances that have been non-compliant in the past 15 days. Mary's gonna click on that, and she's gonna find out whose accounts those instances are in, and so she can identify which accounts, which regions are non-compliant pretty quickly and easily. And so this is everything that has been set up, and so that's automation that she has just using Systems Manager and Patch Manager. Now if we go on to Thursday, uh, Mary's team are again thankful that they started using Systems Manager. So they just not only eliminated their patch infrastructure, but all those Bastion hosts that they had previously, they got rid of those too. And so now the CIO is extremely happy with her team because there's a lot of cost that's been eliminated inside of the organization. And what they've started to use is Session Manager. And the other thing with Session Manager is now they've used this as a mechanism to give people access, both SSH and RDP, to the EC2 instances in their organization. Mary's not only made the CIO happy, but she's also made all the security folks happy because now we're shutting down uh, port 22 and port 3389. And they've also instituted policies where Mary can restrict what set of commands are actually run on these boxes using a session manager policy. Mary's also set up configuration where all the commands, all the things that are happening inside of these EC2 instances are being dumped to an S3 bucket so that they can take a look for forensic analysis to see if anything's happened. So the, because this has all been created, Mary's also been able to give the line of business the ability to run commands against the EC2 instances that they've provisioned. So in Service Catalog, they checked out a product, and then they were able to go to a run book, and while they're working with the COTS vendor on site, they were able to do that update because run command in an automation run book took a snapshot first and then applied changes. So they can revert back if they need to without any complication from Mary. So let's just take a look at what the session manager uh, experience inside of Systems Manager might look like in practice. So here, um, we're in the Systems Manager console yet again, and we're gonna go to Fleet Manager. And Fleet Manager is basically where you can do a lot of the things inside of Systems Manager. Uh, in this case, we're going to click on a Linux instance, and we're gonna start a terminal. And once we start that terminal, we can see that I'm right on the command line, and I can do an ls command. But again, uh, Mary can put a session manager policy that prohibits me from doing an ls command and discovering what's going on in the system. Now we terminate state. All of that's now been logged through CloudTrail, and so if the security team needs to see what happened when somebody logged in, they have that visibility as well. 
We're also going to go ahead and Fleet Manager and go into uh, RDP into a Windows instance. So we're going to put the administrator name, which is not something I would recommend, but in this case, in a demo environment, logging as administrator, putting in the passport, and we're going to connect. And so as all things Windows, it's going to take a little bit, um, and then we're going to see a uh, Windows screen in just a second uh, here on the console. And if you, if, Mary, if you wanted to, you can expand it and do whatever administrative things that you would need to do in your fleet of EC2 instances. So now we've worked through Monday through Thursday, and now we're here on Friday. And Friday, uh, Mary's team is able to answer a confident yes and yes to the additional requirements that the business has asked her. So now she can expand with Control Tower to another region and expand those governance and control guardrails that she has. And she can also uh, bring in the additional acquisition account and apply the governance controls uh, inside of her organization to that acquisition account. And so because she was able to say yes and yes and not really do much work, on Friday, they also her team takes the advantage of that time because everything's been automated, to start thinking about additional automation in their toolkit to help, biz, help the business build uh, or better manage change in their expanded environment. Now, one of the pillars of the AWS Well-Architected Framework is the Operational Excellence Pillar. And one of the recommendations in the, is to dedicate some time and resources for continuous incremental improvement to evolve the effectiveness and efficiency of your operation. So now that Mary's team has automated many of their manual processes, they no longer are running behind on meeting the current requirements, so now they're taking a look at how they can evolve and improve their operations. So some of the other things that Mary's team is thinking about is they've only used Systems Manager for patch management as well as inventory and session manager. So they start to take a look at maybe we can implement Incident Manager to manage our incidents or Change Manager to automate uh, change management inside of our organizations with integration with our partners such as ServiceNow. They also think about using Secrets Manager because they want to get more secure, and there's a lot of sharing of passwords and plain text with developers and, and teams. So they decide, let's take a look at Secrets Manager and how we can vault this, and again, get the benefits of Cloud Trail integration to see who is uh, taking secrets out and using them um, in any kind of fashion. They also consider uh, doing a workshop or running a uh, kind of workshop with other or teams inside of their organization to tell them about the benefits of automation, how to use these APIs inside of AWS so that those teams can also be successful in what they're doing. And really, at the end of Friday, they're not thinking about work on the weekend. So Mary's able to enjoy uh, her pets, her family, going out to dinner in the city that she's in, um, playing video games, or binge watching uh, on Netflix and catching up on shows. But now, Let's talk to a real life customer. Um, and so I want to welcome Ashish Wadwa from Sun Life to talk about their journey in automation inside of Sun Life. OK, thank you, Aaron. So I'm a real life Mary major. And honestly, we didn't give them the use case when they were preparing the slides. But when I went through those slides, I actually thought that this is what we are. And eventually, like if we have managers on the, in the audience as well, right? Like they should be going through the same problem that we go through in our organization. But before I go into our use case on how we have developed cloud at Sun Life, I would quickly go through who we are as Sun Life. So we are an insurance provider, and we have been rated as top 100 asset managers in the world. Uh, we are in a uh, business of taking care of people. So we have more than 30,000 advisors and distributors and partners across the world. And the biggest challenge that we have, which is good for business, but from my perspective as an engineering lead, is that we are across the world. And it's not a small setup. Our company is set up hugely in US, hugely in Asia, as well as in Canada. But setting up cloud in Sun Life is not an easy journey, because in my personal opinion, it's not difficult to set up cloud. What is difficult is to set up a cloud in financial institution. When you're regulated, you need to be compliant, and you need to make sure your, all your guardrails and controls are in, the, in place. Because if I consider ourselves as Sun Life, we are the data guardians and we are the data caretakers of our consumers. And how do we implement that and make sure that we are uh, maintaining the pace of cloud within the organization is quite important. We have a cloud-first strategy. This is a note from our CIO who clearly mentions that we, she really wants us to be very innovative and bringing cloud solutions faster to our consumers. So that's the biggest buy-in we got. So our, 
our CIO completely agrees to this, that there should be cloud first, and we need to motivate every application within Sun Life to move towards cloud. We also are very focused towards being the digital leader in our financial industry, and we really want to provide bigger solutions to our consumer faster and uh, in, more, in a more secure manner. How I relate more with what Aaron and Emily says is because, as I said, we, are global, we have a global customer base, and as our senior management is more focused towards going on cloud, we really want to make sure that a, our, a, a developer sitting in Hong Kong and a developer sitting in US should have the right guardrails available. But the challenge is, now we are telling the business that, guys, you need to go on cloud and you need to prepare a migration plan that this is your application looks like, that's how you have to move to cloud. But how do we make that pace uh, so that we are available for those businesses? Because at the end of the day, I don't want to be on that receiving end where we are not ready from the cloud platform perspective. So our biggest challenge is how cloud adoption can be taken place across the globe. And the second thing is we really want to scale up the platforms, not the cloud teams. That's the, so we don't want to create like admin pods in Asia, admin pods in US or Canada. We really want to be centric, and everything should be cool. I'm just going to give you a quick oversight on how we have dealt it with, within the cloud space in Sun Life, and we have a centric team in Canada that manages this. So we really wanted to provide our developers autonomy, and we really wanted to get away from their path. We don't want it to be a dependency on a developer to be waiting for us to deliver resources to them, provisioning an S3 bucket for them, or building SQS queues or whatever. So we really wanted to make sure that our developers sitting in Hong Kong, Singapore, or like Canada or US, they can self-deploy those services. That was the biggest challenge we had. Second thing was whenever they're deploying those services, are we actually providing them the security controls? Because we really want them to be focused more on building applications rather than being thinking about, oh, is this secure to use this over here or whatnot, and whether it is compliant to the directives that the CISO uh, organization provides. Third thing is building more and more cloud auto automation. And I'm going to talk more about this. So in starting 2022, we, we, we came through AWS workload account strategy. So we were a shared account shop in which we used to have shared accounts, shared resources, each resource shared by multiple roles, each role using multiple resources. So you have to change or delete a role that can break the other resource or other account. So we were, we were quite messed up at that stage. So we went into account workload account stage. Second thing we built up in 2022 was the control tower. So what Aaron and Emily were saying, control tower has been the biggest win for us in 2022. Why? Because we don't have to be bothered enough to enable an account in Hong Kong and enable an account in US, as I always say, because all accounts are provisioned through control tower. They have the minimum guardrails. And as per the CISO's objectives or directives, we actually port them into that uh, provisioning environment. And third thing is cloud automation. This diagram that you see on your screen is how we were set up in 2021. All resources shared, IAM permissions shared. So if I have to break an IAM permission, I may rather break a couple of codes. And we are still struggling with that. We get a lot of Sonra alerts. We got a lot of uh, uh, guard duty alerts where we are deprovisioning access or deprovisioning roles. We, those resources are actually connected to somebody else. So we went into the workload account approach. So what does a workload account approach is? Each account that you enable is attached to a cost center. So if you are a developer, you get your workload account, and we'll give you the, the cloud formation templates and Terraform module libraries through which you can deploy your resources by itself. So, and your cost center is attached to it. So you don't need to worry about uh, what my cost is, and I don't have the visibility to the cost. Because in the shared account model, each resource is shared. So you don't understand what cost is being acquired by what resource and what uh, account is using that. Right now, if John is my developer sitting in Hong Kong, they can get a workload account, they can attach a cost center to it, and they can deploy whatever resources our team is building through platform modules, and those modules come with guardrails. So you don't have to worry about, oh, I need to have contact an admin sitting in India to deploy a service for me. It is available, readily available through an account, and you can just double click on the modules and deploy those services. So that's where we got away from, uh, in, on the, we, were, we were a blocker earlier, but that's where we are getting away. I won't say that we have 100% there on Terraform module or CloudFormation templates on deploying those services, but it's a journey. AWS release a lot of services, and we are still working and testing it with the consumers. So that's the first problem we sorted out. We gave the developers autonomy to manage their own accounts, manage their own cost centers, and we sitting in Canada don't have to deal with any admin kind of issues with them. 
They manage, they have their views, they understand their cost, they deploy their resources, they spin up, they spin down by themselves. So, sorry. Next problem was, how do we enable these environments, and how do we make sure that code is uniform and compliant? So on a, in, in 2021, on a bad day, an engineer can misconfigure an environment, and there could be a breach, or there could be an incident that come up, and our cloud engineers are okay, so we need to set up another engineering team in Asia to set that up. We came across the control tower. We were on landing zone shop, and we turned from a landing zone to control tower. Through Control Tower, we have implemented those minimal guardrails that get provisioned when an account is created. So I'm not worried about, about whenever an account is being created in any location across the globe, it should, comply, it should be compliant because from our engineering perspective, we make sure all those guardrails are implemented through those accounts, through Control Tower. And the best part with the Control Tower is that our cloud operations team can centrally manage and see the footprint of cloud across Sun Life because they don't need to set up their individual pods in those zones. You can attach your monitoring or oversight or observability tools with Control Tower and you can have complete access to what account is being provisioned in Australia or like Hong Kong or US sitting at one location. So as I said, we, our goal is not to scale up the platform. Our goal is, sorry, our goal is not to scale up the cloud teams. Our goal is to scale up the platform. So Control Tower has actually helped us a lot on this front. So these are kind of some kind of controls that we implement through Control Tower. I can go in details about this. I really don't want to because this is, these are ma majorly like AWS best practices, and it all depends on the cloud CISO office of your organization, what kind of directives they want to push in. So whenever a cloud engineer on my team works on building these controls and uh, guardrails, they actually go through AWS best practices, as well as we have our cloud security directives in the organization, which we incorporate whenever we are building guardrails within a control tower. So where are we right now? So Sun Life is backed by control tower right now. So there's one control tower through which a developer, as, I, as I've repeatedly said, sitting in any location can go through a storefront, enable a workload account with them. The workload account comes attached to a cost center, each workload account, you can deploy those services that are being built through Terraform modules or CloudFormation templates. And we don't have to worry about whether those accounts are compliant or not. They are already, make, our engineers make sure that those minimal level of standards and controls are baked in. And we don't, and they're on their own. There can be cases where they want custom built controls, but that, is, that can be built over that. But Control Tower ensures that your all accounts are uniform, all the controls that you want to enable in all regions are um, maintained through uh, control tower pipelines. That's have been, that has been our Sun Life journey. So the biggest challenge that I, we, we were facing was global, global enablement of cloud platform across. And that's where we accomplished it through our workload account strategy, as I said. And going back to the control tower, this has helped us enable those accounts, maintain the uniformity across those accounts across the globe. Over to you, Emily. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Ashish. So just like we heard from, from Ashish and from Sun Life, the easiest way to get started with managing multiple accounts uh, at scale, whether you're using one region or many, is to make use of AWS Control Tower. So this service is automatically enabling a number of AWS services that are part of our foundational best practices. So I'm talking about AWS organizations. We've got IAM Identity Center, CloudTrail, and Config. We've also recently uh, announced integration with Security Hub. And in addition, we really recommend that you take a look at Systems Manager. I've had a lot of people say to me, Systems Manager is like a bit of an unsung hero. Uh, and you know, we really saw it shine in this example today. We only saw patch compliance, a bit of run command, and session manager. But it actually has so many features. So if you take one thing away uh, from, from this that you might not have thought about already, have a look uh, further into Systems Manager. And we also talked about briefly Secrets Manager. So for those workloads that are running in each of your accounts, if you've got all this manual process around you know, creating, managing, tracking, rotating uh, credentials and secrets, Secrets Manager is really going to help you remove a lot of manual processes from there. So I recommend taking a look at that. And as we saw earlier, services like Security Hub and GuardDuty 
You can deploy uh, that with AWS organizations, and you can run that across all of your different accounts in all of your regions. So you can easily get that visibility of your compliance to your security standards. You can uh, integrate and select some best practices or security standards you'd like to have applied. And you can see that across all your accounts. And with guard duty, you can use that to mitigate threat detection. So these services here, these are the kind of services that those elite performers that we talked about earlier use. So if you'd like to be an elite performer, strongly suggest that you check these ones out. So in summary, to be able to thrive at work and to have the time for the things that you enjoy, whether that's beach time, baking, outdoors, gaming, whatever, right? Think about having a culture that revolves around three things. Codifying everything, getting visibility into your environment, into your workloads, understanding the security, the performance, the operations of your environment, and thinking about whatever you can automate, whether that's provisioning, deployment, responses to incident management, account creation globally. Now, at, as solutions architects at AWS, we regularly share some lessons that have been learned from Amazon, from AWS, and of course, from working with customers. All of this knowledge and guidance is available to all of you. It's distilled into the Amazon Builders Library. We're going to call that out this morning. Definitely take a look at that. Some great information there about how we think about automation. There are so many different white papers and guides, and of course, we've got AWS Well Architected Framework. Automation is something that features strongly in all of this guidance. Automation is how we thrive, and how we scale, and how you can too. So we've talked through quite a lot of services um, in this talk today. So I recommend that you take some uh, quick snaps of these QR codes here. So we've got some getting started guides for the services that we talked about today and some quick setup guides as well. These are going to help you and your team add some more automation into your operational processes. Leave this up a second. Cool. Good to see. So at AWS, we also love to hear some feedback. So we're going to have a session survey. So please do complete that. And you can come and talk to us as well. Come and visit our CloudOps kiosk over at the Expo if you want to ask some more in-depth questions. But I think we do have some time to take some questions. So I want to say thanks, everyone. Do fill out the survey. And give a big thanks to Ashish Wadwa and to the Sun Life team for sharing their automation journey with us today. And if you've got some questions that you'd like to ask and maybe hear a bit more from Ashish about Sun Life's journey, please do go ahead. We've got some time. Thank you.